Chapter 5 May 1940 The gates of the ghetto and lodges are shut tight. 180,000 Jewish men, women, and children are herded together inside a barbed wire cage. Unemployment, hunger, disease. They come together and spread their pain and misery. The Nazis order all machinery surrendered to them. No more factories, no more jobs. Mothers look helpless with tears in their eyes at the faces of their hungry children. Fathers, angry and frustrated, spend their days looking for work only to find all doors closed to them. Lost, bewildered children move about, wondering what to do with all their free time. Vacation is long over, but no schools are open for children of the ghetto. They play a new game, Escape from the Germans. They form two groups, Jews and Germans. The idea is to not get caught by Germans trying to find and kill the Jews. A Judenrat, a Jewish council appointed by the Nazis and watched over by them, governs the ghetto. Despair turns the people against them. An outcry. March to the Judenrat reaches the homes. It spreads swiftly over the ghetto and brings thousands of people out of their crowded rooms into the lines of a march for life. Mama, Motel, Lebel, Moshel, and I join the march. Many others join on our way. We want work, people shout. We want jobs for our mothers and fathers. We want food for our hungry children. We want bread. We want to live. Voices of young and old form one desperate outcry. We reach our destination, the Judenrat. The marchers grow louder and angrier. Schools bred jobs, they chant in one voice. After hours of shouting, the door to the Judenrat office is finally open. The people ask for a delegation to represent the issues to the Judenrat and try to find a way to ease the problems. The March for Life does not result, does bring results. Kitchens to supply soup and bread, hospitals, schools, factories. In a short time, the ghetto and its well-organized government under the dictatorship of Sham Rumkowski, a man hungry for power and wealth. But the soup kitchen, schools, and hospitals do not last very long. Again, hunger and disease take over and spread into the crowd, the crowded ghetto. Tuberculosis and dysentery hit every home and spread like wildfire, taking hundreds of lives daily. My little brother Label contracts tuberculosis. Combined to his bed, he stays all alone all day, waiting for the moment when the door will finally open and Mama, Motel, Moshel, and I return home from a long day in the tailor shops, bringing him love and some soup that we all saved from him from, from our rations at work. Now that the Nazis have taken away our factory, we work at several shops. I work at the same shop as Mama. Together, we saw German. We sew German military coats all day long. My back bends over from the weight of the heavy coats. My fingers bleed from the stabbing and piercing of the sharp needles. My body aches. I wish I could rest for a while, just a little while. The needle slips slowly out from my young and experienced fingers and rests angrily in the coat on my lap. Do not stop now, says the sharp needle. Keep going. Hold me tighter. Work, work, work. If you want to live, work, work. Startled, I put my fingers tighter around the needle and work. I feel anger rising within me, a small voice trying to get out and shout to all those tired souls around me. Look at us. Look at us. Look at what we are sewing. Coats for Germans to wear in the front to keep them warm so they stay healthy and kill, kill, kill. But the angry voice within me does not reach my lips. It remains, shouting inside me. I look at Mama working next to me. Her face pale and sad, her tears flowing silently over her sunken cheeks bring a stabbing pain to my heart. I feel her anguish. It is Labelle she is crying for, the sweet, gentle child she has to leave, sick, cold, and lonely at home. I still hear the doctor's voice. I am so sorry. I wish I could do something for him. I wish I could help. He has tuberculosis. He needs good food, fresh air, better living conditions, medicine. Maybe then he would have a chance. But my little brother has no chance. He is only 13. He lies in his bed all day long, dreaming of Mama's warm touch, her smile. It is cold at home. There is no coal or wood, or wood left to keep the house warm. The wooden parishion used to separate the kitchen from the bedroom has long since been taken apart and used for firewood. Even some of the furniture has been burned. Labelle looks all day at the frost-covered windows and the pretty icy flowers Mother Nature paints. He marvels at their beauty while dreaming of a better tomorrow. He is such a sensitive child. We have to force him to take an extra share of bread, a little more soup. He pleads, don't give me your food. You will all get sick. It will not help me get well. Mama touches his face and whispers softly, you will get well. 
This nightmare will end soon. You will get well again. He wants so much to believe those words. He wants so much to live. He cuddles close to Mama and whispers, I love you so very much. He wipes the tears from Mama's cheeks. Many evenings I sit on the edge of his bed. I tell him what is happening in our barbed wire cage, what life is out like outside his room at the shop, at our secret study groups. Le Bell, I say, there is no more schools for us here, but we cannot let the Nazis destroy our minds. Some of us have formed secret study groups. If we have no teachers, we will teach one another. He listens with interest to my every word. His eyes shine. I speak with him of tomorrow that is coming for all of us. This day will come, my darling brother. You'll see. You'll see. We'll walk out of this cage free to build a new life, a new world. No more hunger, freedom, happiness, a world of brotherhood, a world of love and peace. He takes my hand in his, looks into my eyes, searching for the answer, and whispers, Will I live to see that day? Do I have a chance? I hold him, tightly kiss his light brown hair, and trying to sound positive, strong, I say, You will live. We will all survive. Now I look at Mama, and I wish I could find the words to ease her pain. She wants so much to be with her sick child, to hold him, to comfort him. The harsh metallic shrieking of the sewing machines filled the air. I look at the human skeletons bending over the machines, pushing the pedals with their last, last bit of strength. Is there a tomorrow for them? Is there a tomorrow for me? Suddenly screams filled the crowded room. People run, their eyes filled with terror and despair. I run too. On the floor, I see stretched out, hardly breathing, a young man. His eyes are closed, his face ashen, his hands pressed against his heart. From his lips, blood silently flows over his bony chin and forms one big black spot on the wooden floor. I look with horror at the blood of this dying lungs, leaving his body. His eyes flash a last desperate cry for help when they close forever. His body is removed. The dark, ugly spot formed by the blood of his lungs remains. It says to me, this is what is waiting for you, for your mother, for your brothers. I cover my mouth to hold back my screams. I run to Mama's arms. The shrieking and crying of the sewing machines fill the air again.